So. Ja, ich darf Sie auch nochmal sehr herzlich begrüßen. Wie gesagt, Thomas Biebricher, ich wäre auch gerne am Goethe-Institut, aber bis jetzt äh, nur an der Goethe-Universität. Ähm, ich vertrete da eine Professur für internationale politische Theorie und ähm, freue mich sehr, heute dieses Gespräch moderieren zu dürfen zwischen äh, Chantal Bouff und Rainer Forst. Zunächst ein paar organisatorische Sachen, bevor ich dann nochmal unsere Diskutanten vorstelle, etwas ausführlicher. Ähm, die Sprache auf dem Podium wird Englisch sein. Aber das ist Ihnen wahrscheinlich auch schon bewusst. Einige von Ihnen haben auch schon die Kopfhörer. Also wenn Sie lieber eine Übersetzung haben würden, wir haben zwei hervorragende Übersetzer hier, die auch schon am Werk sind, die werden das machen und ich werde dann so im Laufe der Ankündigung hier langsam ins Englische übergehen. Wir haben uns das ungefähr so vorgestellt, dass die beiden ein Eingangsstatement halten werden. Dann werde ich ein paar Fragen an Sie richten. Hoffentlich werden Sie auch miteinander einfach diskutieren. Und dann werden wir das ähm, im Laufe der Zeit, die uns zur Verfügung steht, wir haben ungefähr anderthalb Stunden, werden wir dann das auch irgendwann in Richtung ähm, des Publikums, dem Publikum öffnen. Sie können gerne Fragen stellen, ähm, Kommentare einbringen. Äh, wenn Sie es, also wann immer Sie das Gefühl haben, jetzt ist mal Zeit für eine Intervention, bitte scheuen Sie sich nicht. Äh, Sie können auch gerne die Fragen auf Deutsch stellen. Wir haben auch hier oben eine simultane Übersetzung auf dem Podium. Das sollte also kein Problem sein. Aber ähm, falls es dazu nicht kommt, dann gibt es auf jeden Fall äh, in Richtung des Endes hin nochmal eine Fragerunde von Ihrer Seite, weil es geht um inklusive Demokratie. Da wäre es sehr unglücklich, wenn Sie überhaupt nicht zu Wort kämen. Um, okay, I think this is going to be the part where the German language recedes in the background and I will switch to English. Um, I think I could be at the Goethe Institute, maybe in, in the United States. Um, I'll start with um, our guest from the University of Westminster, uh, Chantal Mouffe, is a political theorist. She is um, at the Department of Politics Inter and International Relations at the University of Westminster and is also the director for the study of democracy there, if I'm not mistaken. Am I doing anything wrong? No. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, um, of her many publications, I'm only going to uh, list three, actually, three monographs. Uh, first of all, together with Ernesto Laclau, uh, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy Towards a Radical Democratic Politics from 1985, uh, which is a really, really important publication. Uh, it's one that I actually read when I went to college, and that changed a lot of things uh, in my head, at least, and I think it did so for many people, uh, reshaped the Marxist slash post-Marxist discourse uh, by informing it uh, with all kinds of um, postmodern notions, uh, Derridian notions of identity and so on and so forth. Uh, really important publication, I think, not just for me. Um, then I would like to mention The Democratic Paradox, published in uh, 2000. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe we'll hear some of the things uh, that are discussed in, in this book. And at least, you know, if not, I get to ask what The Democratic Paradox is all about. And then finally, um, on the political, um, uh, the, the latest monograph, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, it also gives you a sense uh, about one of the inspiration uh, for, one of the many inspirations for Chantal Mouffe's work, uh, it's Carl Schmidt, um, who was also interested in the political. Um, our second guest today is Rainer Forst. Uh, he is a professor of political theory and philosophy at the Goethe Universität in Frankfurt am Main. Um, he's also um, the, the co-chair uh, of the Cluster of Excellence, the, the Formation of uh, Normative Orders, um, that I also work for, for the record. Um, and I'm also going to list some of his publications, many publications to list there too. Uh, first of all, uh, Kontexte der Gerechtigkeit, Politische Philosophie, Jenseits von Liberalismus und Kommunitarismus, published in 1994. That's also a book that I read when I was in college. And so this is a great opportunity for me. And it's not, you know, I didn't even read that many books in <laughs> And I didn't even read that many books in college. So, you know, this is, um, it's a great, uh, this is a great um, coincidence for me. Uh, then I'm just going to list uh, Das Recht auf Rechtfertigung from 2007 and Die Kritik der Rechtfertigungsverhältnisse published in 2011. Yes, and if you prefer to read them in English, uh, they're all translated into English as well, and uh, many of the works of Chantal Mouffe are translated into German. Um, 
The topic for today's talk is inclusive democracy, um, zum Verhältnis von Demokratie und Gerechtigkeit, inclusionary democracy on the relation between democracy uh, and justice. Uh, we agreed that Chantal Mouffe is going to go first with her presentation. Okay, thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here um, in, invited by the Henrik Boll Foundation to uh, reflect on, yeah, thank you very much, um, question of Bosch Telodemokratie. Um, well, I thought that to begin this reflection, it was important, and I'm sure that's something that you've been doing dur uh, during those last uh, two days, but I will you know, also want to um, make my small contribution to this, to examine the current state of democratic institution, uh, which you know, I think unfortunately is not very good, uh, and understand the meaning of the recent protest movement. So what kind of challenge uh, do those movements present Know, to um, democratic uh, institution, to our actual model of, of democracy. Um, but first, I want to insist on one thing, that I think it's very important not to homogenize those movements. I'm always really very surprised when I hear, and that happens, a lot of people who put together uh, the, what happened in the Middle East, um, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Libya and even no Syria, um, with the protest in uh, in Israel, with the the riots in London, the indignados in Spain, the the, the movement in, in in Greece, the the, the movement in Chile. I mean, the, the, there is a tendency to say, oh well, there is, there is a new type of molecular politics which is now happening, um, and you know we were going to try to see what are the consequences of that. I think that is really very important to not put all those uh, uh, movements in, in the same you know, bag, uh, because they need to really be differentiated. If, if not, we are not really going to understand uh, their uh, meaning. In fact, there are grand, very big differences among th those movements. And to take just one example, a small example, but it, it will uh, uh, show you um, that it does not make sense to put together all those things. Often we uh, hear that uh, the indignados in Spain and for instance, the Chilean uh, student movement is part of the same, same you know, move, de de development. Well, there are enormous differences uh, uh, between those two movements. Because, for instance, the student movement in, in, uh, in, in Chile, well, it's something which is much more you know, similar to a traditional uh, uh, left-wing uh, student movement. It's a movement which is very organized. Uh, it's a movement which is demands, demands about you know, education, free education, good education, demands which are addressed to the state. It's a movement uh, who does not at all uh, refuse party affiliation. In fact, the, the first president, Camila Vallejo, uh, um, was, is still a member of the Communist Party. And in fact, she is now a, a candidate for the um, they are, going, they are going to be national election in um, Chile very soon, and Camila Vallejo is a candidate for the Communist Party. Well, as, as you know, the indignados, they don't want to have absolutely anything with uh, party politics. They don't want to be organized. They don't want to be a leader. So I think that to put the, 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 the student movement in Chile and the indignados, the manifestation of the same, same new phenomenon is completely uh, misleading. Um, so I'm going, in fact, to concentrate on advanced liberal democratic societies. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave aside the question of the Middle East because I think that it requires a completely different type of analysis. And I'm going to concentrate mainly on basically the indignance uh, movement and on the various type of Occupy movement. Um, well, there have been, in fact, two types of interpretation about the meaning of those uh, uh, movements of the outrage. Two types of uh, interpretation that, in fact, uh, depend very much on uh, how you understand radical politics. And in, in previous uh, um, work, I have made a distinction between two forms of radical politics, one which is, I will 
called withdrawal from and another one a strategy of engagement with. The first strategy of withdrawal from is a strategy also which is called uh, exodus. It's a strategy which is, of course, influenced by uh, the work of uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri in, in Empire, uh, Multitude, and, and Commonwealth, and also some other post operaist uh, thinker. And uh, according to them, what is really imp important is uh, to abandon, you know, the field of representative politics, not to care about parties, about trade unions, so, uh, not about transforming the state, but to withdraw from this and build next next to that a new type of institution. Uh, and of course, as, as you know, for them is the multitude, you no, know, which is really uh, 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 the, the important agent, and the multitude which is going to uh, um, create new form of organization of the common. Um, there, against that, I've uh, defended on uh, my part the strategy of what I call a strategy of engagement with. Instead of withdrawal from uh, an in, in existing institution, we should try to actively engage with those institutions in order to transform them. So it's a strategy of uh, you know, what, what Gramsci would call a war of position. So it's a, it's a strategy of uh, an hegemonic struggle in order to transform the existing uh, uh, state um, and you know, radicalize uh, uh, democracy. That's uh, an, an, um, something that we defended already in uh, hegemon and socialist strategy to whom uh, Thomas Bibriker uh, referred. So um, if, if you follow uh, uh, the exodus approach, you are going to have a completely different reading of those protest movements than if you follow the withdrawal, uh, the, the engagement with. For instance, according to the... Uh, uh, exodus approach, or the people who are influenced by, by that uh, line, uh, what we are seeing in those protest movements is the emergence of a new type of molecular politics that manifests the power of the multitude to construct new form of social relation outside representative institutions. And of course, they celebrate those movements precisely because the, uh, of, of the fact that they do not engage with representative politics, that they really uh, are critical of representative politics, and they see in them the realization of the common. And the common is really the, become a very big uh, 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 point of reference for all those thinkers. Um, and also, they present what's happening in those movements as a prefiguration of what uh, uh, Arden Negri call absolute uh, democracy. Well, I'm not going to, I don't have time to really enter uh, more into uh, a critique of this approach because what I would like to do is to uh, present my uh, own uh, interpretation of those protest movements and try to see you know, what, what kind of challenge they pose to uh, uh, democratic institutions because there is of course no doubt that uh, uh, what I would call really existing liberal democratic institutions are in a very bad shape. Um, so it's, the, the question is not to say that everything is going well, but the question is that, how would, should we try to transform those institutions or should we try just to abandon it altogether? And my interpretation of the recent protests is in fact informed by the approach which I elaborated in the, my book on the political that was also recently mentioned. And in that book, I criticize what I call the post-political trend uh, which was really, you know, uh, the zeitgeist in our liberal democratic societies. And I affirm that we are witnessing a crisis of representation. But this crisis of representative institution is due to uh, um, the fact that there has been some kind of consensus at the center, which have been established in, in all, uh, we could say, liberal democratic societies. Um, and this consensus, of course, con uh, it, it consists in the fact that um, we don't really have no uh, left-right uh, distinction, which is clear, because parties of, uh, of, of the left no present themselves as being center-left. So we've got a center-left parties versus a center-right party, but both of them, in fact, uh, of offer exactly the same kind of, of uh, uh, well, they, 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 they offer no strategy because they, their main uh, uh, argument that there is no alternative to neoliberal globalization. And the only thing that can be done when the center uh, uh, left government comes to power is to manage a bit more humanely this neoliberal globalization. So, of course, you know, this consensus at the center um, is the result of the unchallenged hegemony of neoliberalism, 
Uh, and it deprived democratic citizens of what I call an agonistic debate where they could make their voice heard and choose between real alternatives. Because as I was saying, there is uh, the, the main tenet of those, uh, uh, this consular center is that there is no alternative. Well, in fact, already in, 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 um, on the political, I was trying to see the negative consequences of that because many people have been arguing, oh no, but that is fantastic. No, there is a blurring of the light between left and right. There is some kind of constitution of the center. It means that democracy has become more mature. Um, so there, there is no more uh, antagonism. And this is a progress for democracy. Well, in, on the political, I was in fact showing that the development of right-wing populist movement was a consequence of this uh, uh, the, consensus at the center, because they were the, the one which were trying to you know, present, uh, of course, false and, and uh, an acceptable alternative, but saying to the people, they are alternative. We are going to give you the possibility to really you know, make your voice heard. What I find really interesting in what's happening uh, uh, with those protest movements is that finally we've got another type of uh, reaction of resistance against this uh, uh, consensus of the center and uh, uh, a reaction that is you know protest which is of course much more uh, 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 progressive and um, is it was time really for uh, the progressive sector to also manifest their uh, resistance and their rejection of the um, post political uh, order uh, but basically, what I, 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 I think, and that's how I read those protests, this is a rejection of what is also been called the post-democratic state of our societies. You know, it, it's, it's a, a concept which has been developed by, by Tolling Croach, and uh, Jacques Rancière also has spoken about that. And I agree with that. In fact, in a sense, when I speak of the post-political, it's something uh, similar. Um, it is basically uh, to indicate that our society still call themselves democratic, but the whole of, of, of the meaning of democracy has been emasculated. And it's, it's, it's not really, uh, um, our, our society cannot really be called uh, um, de de democratic. And uh, so there is really a democratic deficit, which is absolutely crucial in those democratic, post democratic societies. And I think that most of those protests are precisely uh, uh, something that is against this post-democracy. Uh, if so many people, and not only among the young, also among you know older uh, people across the whole population, are not taking to the street, is because they've lost faith in traditional parties and they feel that their voice cannot be heard through traditional political channels. In fact, as one of the motto of the protester uh, claims, they say, "We have a vote." but we don't have a voice, and it's absolutely true, because if basically you can choose between two parties which offer the same kind of politics, you don't really have a voice. It's, it's a vote that does not offer an, an, an alternative. So if we understand uh, those current protests as a refusal of the post-political order, then I think we can read them as a call for a radicalization of existing democratic institutions, not for their rejection. What they exact are better, more inclusive form of representation. To satisfy their demand for voice, existing representative institutions have to be transformed. And of course, new ones should also be established so as to create the condition for what I call a real agonistic confrontation where citizens are going to be offered real alternative. And of course, such a confrontation cannot exist if there is no not emergence of a genuine left, a left that is able to offer an alternative to so the social liberal consensus, which has become dominant in center left uh, parties. At the center of the, this dispute, now I'm, I'm moving uh, to uh, some reflection, it's a bit more uh, theoretical. Uh, this discussion about how to interpret the recent protests lies in fact a very old discussion, a discussion about the nature of democracy and the role of representation in democracy. 
two positions again confront each, each other. Uh, uh, and here again, we find the difference between the two approaches, exodus or war of position. Uh, one sees representative democracy as an oxymoron and argue that a real democracy needs to be a direct or even some call it an horizontalist one one that will not be contaminated by liberal institutions. I think it's a bit ironical, I must say, because uh, this view, in fact, chimes with the critique which has been directed by Carl Schmitt to liberal democracy. Uh, Carl Schmitt deemed liberal democracy an unviable, unviable regime because, as he put it, liberalism negates democracy and democracy negates liberalism. And Schmitt insisted that uh, um, in fact, representation is not something that comes from democracy. The rep representation is something that comes from liberalism. And of course, he was adamant that you know, this, this was something that had to be abandoned. Uh, uh, Thomas referred to the fact that you know, I've got, as he put it, a source of inspiration in Schmidt, but I must say that I absolutely disagree with Schmidt about, about, about that. You know, so it's, it's, uh, I think that um, my uh, uh, reflection, and that was part of the developing the democratic paradox, is that Schmidt is right in a sense to say that there is that liberalism and democracy are something that the preprint to logic uh, that cannot be really uh, uh, ultimately reconciled. For instance, uh, here I, I disagree, for instance, with uh, Habermas' idea of the co-originality between uh, liberty and equality, because basically that's what is at stake in the two traditions. Or even uh, uh, Etienne Balibar's idea of e egal liberté. I think that Schmidt is right. There are those, you can't have both this per perfect equality and a perfect liberty. So they are not reconcilable, uh, ultimately. But I think it's wrong to say that there is a contradiction between those two logics. And I've uh, argued that we should see uh, that as a tension, a tension which is, in fact, is very important because this is the space where uh, a, a pluralist democracy can really exist. And um, this, of course, lead to a very different understanding of the relation between uh, liberalism and, in, and democracy. And I have precisely in the democratic paradox uh, uh, tried to show how um, what we call Western liberal democracy, and sometimes it's called modern democracy, but I've, I've, I've brought really problem with this term modern. Uh, I've, I've become no very critical of, of that. If you want, I can explain in the discussion why. I argue that uh, is the articulation of two traditions, liberalism with its emphasis on liberty and pluralism and democracy, postulating equality and popular liberty, and popular sovereignty, sorry. While both of them is important strength, they are ultimately irreconcilable. And the history of liberal democracy has been driven by this tension between the claim for liberty and the claim, claim for equality. No, what has happened under neoliberal hegemony is that the liberal component has become so dominant that, in fact, the all of the democratic uh, uh, as, aspect, the democratic values, have, have been uh, uh, really ab abandoned. Um, for instance, several previous democratic advances have been dismantled and under the motto of modernization, core democratic values are, have been dismissed as being archaic. Uh, without underestimating the democratic shortcomings of social democracy, I think it's clear that the situation has drastically worsened under neoliberal hegemony. The democratic value of equality has been set aside, conveniently replaced by choice in the discourse of the third way and its social liberal avatars. It is, I think, really regrettable that so many parties on the center left are ready to accommodate themselves to what has rightly been qualified as our post-democratic condition. So it's true, there, there is a problem uh, 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 with the state of our institution. But of course, I think it's a mistake to 
see the current uh, situation as the final way of articulating liberalism and democracy and arrive to the conclusion that then we need to abandon the liberal uh, component. And I think, for instance, another experience of progressive government in South America in the last decade proved that it is possible to challenge neoliberalism and to reestablish the priority of democratic values while uh, without relinquishing liberal uh, uh, representative institutions. And those experiences also show that the state, far from being an obstacle to democratic advances, can in fact be an important vehicle for fostering popular demands. So this is why I feel that the recent what I will call the citizen awakening in Europe and the USA is very encouraging because it breaks with the post-political consensus. A taboo is broken and no many voices are being heard contesting the inequalities existing in our society. However, to effectively challenge neoliberal hegemony, I think it is crucial that all the energy that have erupted are not diverted towards wrong alleys. And I'm afraid that this is what could happen if representative institutions become the main target of the protest. There is no denying, I want to insist on that, that they are in crisis in their current liberal democratic uh, form. But I do not believe that the solution resides in the establishment of a non-representative democracy or that, you know, what is sometimes been uh, called extra-parliamentary struggle to refer to the social movement, are the only vehicle for making democratic advances. Of course, such views are popular today because they chime with the idea, uh, fashionable among sectors of the left, that the multitude could auto-organize itself, uh, av uh, avoiding to, to uh, take power and becoming state. But I think that to find what I would call such an anti political approach among the activists uh, uh, involved in those protests is really uh, uh, worrying. Because when representation is seen as the problem, then the aim cannot be to engage with current institutions to try to make them more representative, more accountable, but to discard them entirely. Then the objective of the movement will be visualized in terms of an exodus from the given form of democracy and the ground uh, on the ground that attempting to transform those institutions uh, and that is impossible and that representative democracy is to be relinquished. So I think we should really not identify uh, uh, our current post-democratic form with what is representative uh, democracy. What needs to be challenged is the lack of alternative offer to the citizen, not the very idea of representation. A pluralist democratic society cannot exist without representation. To begin with, and as the anti-essentialist approach is made clear, identities are never already given. They are always produced through discursive construction. And this process of construction is a process of representation. It is through representation that collective political subjects are created. Those subjects do not exist beforehand. Every assertion of a political identity is thereby interior, not exterior to the process of representation. And I will also insist on the fact that in a democratic society where pluralism is not envisaged in the harmonious anti-political form and where the ever-present possibility of antagonism is taken into account, representative institution, by giving form to the division of society, play a crucial role in allowing for the institutionalization of this conflictual dimension. However, such a role can only be fulfilled through the availability of an agonistic confrontation. So what constitutes the central problem with our current post-political model is the absence of a just an agonistic confrontation. And of course, this is not going to be remedied through horizontalist practices. This is not to say, and I want to insist on that to finish, that those practices do not have a role to play in an agonistic democracy. I'm convinced that the variety of those uh, uh, struggles and the multiple forms of molecular activism are valuable, not only to raise consciousness and to bring to the fore issues that are neglected, but also as providing a realm for the cultivation of different social uh, relations. What I contend is that those practices cannot provide a substitute for representative institutions. 
and that it is necessary to establish a synergy between them and other more institutional form of struggle. If the protest movement refuse to establish alliances with traditional challenges, with parties, with trade unions, because you know, they believe that they can't be transformed, then their radical potential will be lost. And I say that I'm still amazed, honestly, that some activists are still celebrating the so-called horizontalist experience in Argentina in 2001, presenting them as the, the piqueteros, as the model to follow, without acknowledging the limits of such a strategy. And they don't seem to realize that the democratic advances that have taken place in uh, South America in the last 10 years have been made possible through an articulation of those uh, movements with uh, parliamentary struggle. And I think that's the kind of experience from which the European left can learn. And it's time, high time, to stop romanticizing spontaneism and horizontalism. The call for democracy that is now uh, being voiced in a variety of quarters can only produce lasting effect if the activists involved in those movements, instead of implementing a strategy of withdrawal, accept becoming part of a progressive collective will, engage in a war of position to radicalize democratic institutions. And just a last word about the title, an inclusive democracy for me. It's not a democracy in which we are going to add more voices to be aggregated you know, to the already existing one. A really inclusive democracy must provide channels that are going to empower citizens, giving them the possibility of choosing between real alternatives. And this is why I think that an inclusive society can only be an agonistic democracy. Thank you. Right. Now my turn. Uh, first of all, um, thanks to Thomas for your kind words, um, um, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to um, the Böll Stiftung for inviting me to this exciting um, conference and especially to this exciting um, panel here. Um, not the least exciting uh, because um, um, of um, being here with Chantal Mouffe, whose work on um, radical democracy uh, and discursive hegemony is an inspiration for anyone who thinks about democracy today. So if I may also add another word of thanks, uh, it's to uh, Petra Zilla, my old friend, whose uh, capacity to um, bring together political theory uh, and practice I do not cease to admire, so thanks so much. <coughs> now. We've been asked to think about inclusive democracy, uh, and the subtitle says uh, that we should also think about the relation between democracy and uh, justice. So I'll do my best uh, to do that. Um, and what I have to say is, uh, in a certain way, a footnote uh, to what uh, Chantal was saying, because I, I agree uh, with her essentially. I just would like to add in a footnote the place that justice might play in our reflections. Um, on inclusive democracy. Why is justice important? Well, you might say in an old-fashioned way, justice is the major virtue, the first virtue of social and political institutions. But I think uh, more essentially when we think about inclusive democracy and social politics, it is important that we keep in mind the many ways in which justice can be understood. Uh, and some of these ways are problematic um, and lead to a real fight and apolitical way to think about what justice demands. And so in a Mufian spirit, I would like to challenge some of the reifications of our way to think about justice, because only if we overcome these reifications can we think justice and democracy together in the right way. There is a view uh, of justice that holds our thinking uh, captive. Also nochmal, damit das, ich weiß nicht, wie, weil ich vielleicht schnell und undeutlich rede, wie gut uh, um, diese hervorragenden Übersetzer das rüberbringen können. Ich sage erst, 
etwas Kritisches zu einem falschen, reifizierten Verständnis von Gerechtigkeit, verbinde dann das bessere Verständnis von Gerechtigkeit mit dem richtigen Verständnis von Demokratie und dann umgekehrt, and then in a, uh, uh, in a way uh, that reflects uh, what Chantal was saying, she started from example and ended up with more, more abstract remarks, I start with more abstract remarks and end with abstract, no, uh, with uh, some more concrete remarks. Um, so, um, the way of thinking about justice that holds our imagination captive and is one-sided focuses on justice as the issue of who gets what. What kind of resources are necessary for achieving a autonomous, good, decent, humane form of life? That's a good question, but if you ask the question as a purely goods and recipient oriented question, who, which goods are necessary for what and who should receive what. You either then come to uh, comparative uh, considerations, uh, those people have that, those people uh, lack something, or you come to what has been quite popular uh, recently in political philosophy, but not just in political philosophy, also in political practice, uh, sufficientarian views. Now you might ask yourself, what is a sufficientarian view? Is ein suffizienzorientierte Überlegung, uh, which means that uh, social politics should be concerned about all people having enough of essential goods for realizing a minimally decent life. So what's problematic about this way of thinking about justice? In a purely goods and recipient oriented view of thinking about justice, the question of how the goods to be distributed come to exist, questions of production and questions of the organization of production are often blocked out of the view because you've, you focus on goods but not on the procedures to bring them about. Second, the, the political question of who determines about which goods are being produced and how they are being distributed is, is often plucked out of the picture. So you find a number of theories of justice which operate with the figure of a distributor, as G.A. Cohen says, as if there is a central authority which could distribute uh, and uh, send out goods to people so if you programmed that distributor correctly, justice could be achieved. And then a politics of justice becomes something like a technocratic programming uh, um, task. Um, and um, in these theories, there are some uh, powerful images uh, that, are, that play a role apart from the distributor, like the goddess of justice who uh, has the power to distribute gods, or there's the famous example of the mother who uh, is asked to distribute a cake uh, um, um, uh, among her children, and the children say, oh, I, I helped bake the cake, or the other says, oh, I'm so hungry, I haven't eaten for days, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, an abstract experiment. Um, and. Um, and, and the other, uh, and, and so they make all kinds of claims. But in these considerations that you often find in political philosophy, the question of who is the mother and why is blocked out because usually we don't ask about, you know, are you my mother and what's your authority? So, um, so this way of thinking about justice is very apolitical. It's goods and, goods and recipient um, um, oriented, but then we might, we might think, well, maybe justice, justice isn't about uh, just receiving certain goods. Maybe justice is something we bring about um, collectively. The uh, purely goods and recipient oriented view also uh, neglects um, the fact, I think it is a fact, that justifiable claims to certain goods do not simply exist and cannot be read off uh, from a social situation, but have to be arrived at in procedures of contestation and justification. And then, if you think about it reflexively, the place persons and citizens have in these debates about production and distribution, that's the real question of justice. It's prior to the question of who receives what. It's the place you have in the procedures, in the institutions in which production and distribution are being talked about. Now, you might think, 
maybe Chantal thinks now, oh, oh, actually, he, I think he, he spoke about democracy rather than justice. Didn't, uh, didn't you? And I think, uh, no, I did speak about justice. So why, why is it justice that is the central term here? Think of what the concept of justice has been invented for. It has been invented to overcome or ban from social orders arbitrariness, the rule of arbitrariness, die Herrschaft der Willkür. Willkür ist, das eigentliche, ist der eigentliche Gegenbegriff zu Gerechtigkeit. You, know, you might think injustice is the antagonistic term to justice, but that doesn't help much. It is arbitrariness. Arbitrariness as a form of rule, of arbitrary rule by individuals or by a, a class, for example, over others, or of the acceptance of social contingencies that lead to social subordination and to domination, and that are rationalized and accepted as an unalterable fate, keine Alternative, even though they are nothing of the sort. The term domination is important here, for it signifies the arbitrary rule of some over others, arbitrary rule as rule without appropriate justifications, and secondly, not just without adequate justifications to those who are subjected to rule, but without having procedures of justification in place that could be um, um, uh, used to challenge given justifications. So the basic impulse, as far as I see it, that opposes injustice is not necessarily that of wanting some more goods uh, that are lacking. That's an important claim to make, obviously. But the basic impulse against un injustice is, I think, the, the, the protest against being dominated and overruled in your standing as an equal citizen with others, as an agent of political justification, having what I call, and Thomas was so kind to uh, mention this title of one of my books, to have a right to justification. Now that doesn't mean that I, don't, don't get me wrong, that I would say the distribution of goods is not an essential task of social justice. It's just that there's a prior question here, and it is the question of distributive and social justice, namely your participation in the procedures of production and distribution. So that's why if we want to think radically about social justice, we have to think about it politically. The first question of justice, therefore, is the question of power. The question of power understood as the effective justificatory power, Rechtfertigungsmacht of individuals, the discursive power to demand, provide justifications, and to challenge false ones. So if we're interested in a theory of justice, it should be a critical theory of justice. It should focus on a critique of what I call the relations of justification, Rechtfertigungsverhältnisse, within a society. An analysis of the dominant and hegemonic justifications, and for that, Chantal Mouffe's work is very important, and an analysis of the power structures, the discursive power structures within a society that turn a society into a particular order of justifications, which also blocks out certain challenges and possible alternative justifications. So that's where democracy and inclusion come in. Democracy, as the practice of justification, is not just one practice of justice, it is the practice of justice. Only a democratic basic structure can satisfy the demand to overcome arbitrary rule can at least try to satisfy that demand. But it must constantly fight against its own arbitrariness in doing so. It must reflexively improve, and I think we're in agreement here too, the conditions of discursive exchange and contestation, as well as decision making. Inclusion is the essential term in this context, as social orders have a tendency to reproduce powerful interests in discursive and institutional form. The first constructive task of justice is to produce structures in which those who are exposed to rule or domination can bring what I call the force towards the better argument, to change a Habermasian term, den Zwang zum besseren Argument, 
where this can be brought to bear against those who exercise or benefit from rule or domination. Democracy is the term for a normative order in which those who are subject to binding legal norms should also be the normative authority that deliberates and decides about these norms. Within democratic processes of justification, deliberation and contestation can be analytically distinguished, but they mostly form a unity. Contestation means to question given justifications, and deliberation means to engage in the practice of reciprocal and general justification. These criteria do not imply a consensus model of legitimacy, for we can often ascertain from a given structure and content of arguments whether they are reciprocally rejectable or not. To give a few examples, I don't think there is a reciprocally generalizable argument for the restriction of the right to get married to heterosexual couples, but I think there is a clear argument for material equality in that context. Likewise, when it comes to the basic standing of citizens in social and political life, I don't think there are acceptable arguments for the refutilizing trends we have witnessed in recent decades where social differentiation and privileges get reproduced from one generation to the other to a very high degree, as all the figures of social statistics tell us. It's neo-feudalism within the heart of neoliberalism. A politics of social justice needs to address these problems, but here inclusion not just means to improve the life chances of the marginalized a little bit, it means rather to improve their political and justificatory power within given institutions, including the power to change them. This also implies not to speak of the weak, die Schwachen, when it comes to social programs, because that's already a discursive mechanism that imputes that these people are in constant need of being helped, not quite autonomous, uh, not fully subjects. And also it implies not to use generational justice as a separate issue of justice, as if we could separate generational from social justice, because all the statistics tell us that some people in the next and uh, more than next generation will be, uh, will be uh, off very well and others won't. So to, to, to build up the illusion of one generation being lucky or not lucky uh, is a mistake. Teilhabe or inclusion then is not, is, is not something that is offered to citizens by way of receiving certain goods, even though receiving the certain goods is an important thing. But it is rather a process of empowerment, we are in agreement here too, um, on the important social and political levels. All too often in our time, as well as earlier actually, it's not that in former times we had the, the wonderful days of democracy and now Oops, they're gone. Uh, democracy is a constant, is a constant struggle each time, has its own, has its own struggles. In our time, this, the whole social machinery is often experienced by many, by the subjected as an alien force overpowering them. And I think that's that's one reason why some of the protest movements that Chantal spoke about go a what she thinks is a rather apolitical uh, uh, route of of radical politics. Um, the whole social machinery is experienced as an alien force overpowering people. Therefore, social and political justice implies the struggle against such forms of alienation. That is why I think an effective response to the financial crisis is absolutely essential for the future of a credible social politics. We can opt for a politics of compensating for uh, the failures of the market and the financial system, but compensating for the failures of this, of this system is not what justice really demands. Justice demands to change that system such that these failures will not produce more and more vulnerable people. So I promised a less abstract argument and, and here it is near the end of my, oh, it's not so bad actually, I'm sorry, it is maybe. Um, so um, how about thinking about democratic justice 
um, by way of institutional innovations. Thinking about how justificatory power can be generated by institutional reforms. I have in mind a version of the Rawlsian difference principle. You might not know about this principle. It says that um, a, uh, a policy uh, is just if it benefits the worst off in a society more than any other possible policy. Um, why don't we think about that principle in discursive terms, giving, as Rawls argued, a veto to the worst off if there are policies that affect them directly. So what could that mean? Imagine we lived in a society which installed a third parliamentary chamber, call it a Sozialkammer or a social chamber. Special representation of social groups is not a completely novel idea, neither in theory nor in practice. Iris Young, for example, has argued for it for the principle of specific representation of what she called oppressed, disadvantaged social groups, which would then be having um, a veto power regarding specific policies that affect a group directly. Now, this proposal has often been criticized in theory for many reasons, some of them stressing the lack of institutional specificity or the excessive power possibly exercised by a group which has a veto and the problem of how to define such groups and their being affected directly. These are important critiques, but are they insurmountable? Maybe there is a way to identify the worst off. Maybe there is a way to define groups of the worst off when it comes to social justice. Some institutional imagination, right, is required to find a place for maybe not a definite, but a temporary, an aufschiebendes veto, a delaying veto, in legislative procedures, and to find ways to enable groups to organize themselves and establish such forms of representation. Democratic justice works, as I said, by way of the force towards the better argument, and such veto positions might be a good way to exercise that force. Yes, there are many problems with such a proposal. Many have uh, pointed out the dilemma of difference. So if you, if you empower disadvantaged groups, there's a lot of public focus on these groups. They are they are in the, at the center of, uh, of attention. They may be locked in their identity uh, given uh, the political um, uh, claims um, they make. But on the other hand, shouldn't we think more about such institutional reforms if we think about the failures uh, of, our party, of our party system? The party of the Greens does, in many ways, a good job of including people. But should we also think about institutional reforms which might facilitate that jobs? Which groups should be, should be included? The unemployed, the least well-educated, ethnic minorities, low-income families, the sick, the elderly, the frail, maybe future generations, depending on we knew how to include them. Those would be the questions that we needed to address. Final word. Democracy as a form of political contestation exists wherever the privileged are forced to renounce their prerogatives because, having been exposed, the ground has been pulled out from under them and justifiable counterpower is being mobilized. Yet such practices of justice and justification are no more confined to the long-established national institutions and political ways of thinking than are the relations of domination to which persons are exposed on a transnational scale. We have to think of justice and democracy, if we think of them in the terms that I suggested, also in terms of processes of recuperation and of the increase of relations of justification, not in terms of fixed and narrow ideals and national boundaries, because we are in so many ways part of transnational normative orders of the exercise of legal, political, and economic power. So if you think about that conundrum, and I think it has a lot to do with the protest movements Chantal was uh, speaking about, that we are part of a transnational order that subjects many people and locks them in um, um, underprivileged social and political situations, then if we think about fair and just forms of representation, representing those beyond our borders is another essential 
task without be asking too much from our institutional imagination. I hope not, at least not in the Böll Stiftung. Thanks for your attention. All right, let's see if this works. Yes, um, so thank you very much for your statements. Um, we have a couple of minutes left uh, to discuss these things. Um, oh, we've got a lot of minutes. Yeah, yeah I was just understating it. Um, so I'd like to start out by maybe framing the discussion we might want to have, at least to start out with, um, and maybe also framing the potential confrontation between these two positions here. Um, if I understood correctly what Chantal Mouffe said, um, there is a tension between liberalism and democracy. Um, there is a tension, an ineradicable tension, between liberty and equality, between liberalism and democracy, between democracy and justice understood in a liberal sense. And when I listened to Rainer Faust's statements, I could have been persuaded that actually everything falls into place uh, and liberalism and democracy can be reconciled if only arranged in the right kind of way. Would you agree with this framing? Because then we might have a problem. <laughs> sure. I think it's on. I think it's on. Uh, it's on, yes, clearly. Um, yes, um, I mean, I agree uh, with, with many of the points that uh, uh, Rainer Force has made, you know, concerning the. the um, reform and, and but I would insist that for me all those things need to be inscribed in, in, in a general narrative um, because in, in order it's it, it, I, I, I think that politics is and, and, and democratic politics is ne necessarily partisan uh, because the, the people is, is necessarily is, is divided uh, there's not the possibility of um, ever having a total you know consensus so for instance there will always be and an if, if we take the case of liberty and equality and their tension well there will always be uh, people who privilege the l l liberty over equality or equality over liberty and i think in a sense this is basically what the distinction left right is about you know and i uh, think that it's wrong to believe that the blurring of the frontier between left and right is is a progress I think that this is something that need we need to come back to a, a much more clear distinction between uh, left and right. That's that's the condition for you know breaking with this post-political uh, consensus and, uh, and and ending this post-democratic situation. Um, so it and, and th th those those narratives are uh, um, yes they are irreconcilable. Uh, but but what, uh, what I understand from, from the agonistic debate is that, and, and, and uh, as I was saying, maybe you know, I, I need to explain a little bit about uh, that because I know that some people have from my relation, my relation to Carl Schmidt rather uh, uh, worrying. But um, so I say I, I agree with, with uh, uh, Schmidt that there is this impossibility of uh, reconciling those two. But I disagree with him in the fact that this is something that invalidates the, the articulation between liberalism and, and democracy. Uh, in fact, I'm, uh, to make you a personal confession, I become much more of a liberal than I was before reading Schmidt because I was much more critical of liberalism before. And, but then reading Schmidt, I began to realize the danger of, of wanting to reject liberalism. And, and I've been become to appreciate the importance that uh, like the liberal tradition, here of course it's clear that I'm, when I speak the liberal tradition, I'm not speaking about capitalism, obviously. Huh? I'm speaking of, uh, about you know, li the, the political tradition of, of, of liberalism. It's something which is, if we are thinking of a pluralist democracy, well, the idea of pluralism is not something that comes from democracy. The idea of pluralism comes from the liberal tradition. And this is why I think it's very important, this tension. I see this tension as productive, but it's something that can you can never be resolved. In that sense, one could say that uh, Derrida, the democracy, sera toujours avenir. 
you know, because the perfect resolution of, of democracy, uh, it, it's something that will, it, it will be self-defeating. Uh, the moment when, you, okay, democracy is absolutely realized. You know, there is no, so there is no more possibility of contestation. So I think that to accept that there will never be a possibility of a total uh, reconciliation and that we need to uh, accept, and that of course the idea of uh, agonistic democracy is that they will always be a, a different position, but instead of uh, treating the, the, the opponents as enemies to be destroyed, and of course that I think the, 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 the Schmidtian way, I think we also, in a because if this of course is impossible, if, if you are going to uh, admit within a, a, a democratic society that the conflict can only take the form of a friend and enemy, then Schmidt is right, that will necessarily lead to a, a, a civil war. And this is why I think Schmidt will no, could not even imagine the possibility of a, a pluralist democracy. But I, uh, the, the idea of the agonism is precisely to say that we, we know that we will never uh, agree, they will, but nevertheless we are going to treat the opponent as a legitimate opponent. The, 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 they defend li li liberty. They think that liberty is more important. You should have, you know, lexical uh, uh, pri uh, privilege with respect to it. Well, okay, they should, you know, defend their position. They should or organize a, pro a project, present a project in which the, to win, to win over the, the, the uh, um, to persuade people that this is the best democracy. And I think that's what the project of uh, right wing project should be. But and the left project needs to. Uh, also construct a narrative around the, the importance of, uh, of e equality uh, without, of course, uh, never negating the fact that the other values are important. So this is the, the f no final reconciliation, but the, 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 the to respect of the position of, 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 of the other and to uh, uh, um, consider them as legitimate uh, ad adversaries. So did I uh, characterize your position correctly that I think it's on already. Um, that if arranged correctly, they're actually mutually supportive, liberalism and democracy. And if that is so, how would you respond to the other position? Well, I think um, justice, the question of justice is about the, the, proper, um, the, the proper way to understand and realize a number of values like liberty and equality. So justice is, a, is based on principles by which we have to find justifiable ways of institutionalizing liberties, forms of equality, um, uh, and other important things in social life. So I agree with uh, Chantal that the constraints on the, 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 so to speak, the democratic rules of the game are, are important procedural constraints. I think where we might have a slight disagreement is in uh, uh, a stark opposition uh, between the party of liberty and the party of equality. Uh, because I think uh, there can be a very powerful um, left and progressive argument based on liberty. Um, Neoliberalism, whatever it exactly means, you're the expert on that. Um, um, uh, if it means a number of the things we have in mind, uh, is not liberty enhancing. It, is it restricts the liberties to live a social life for many people. If you have a very minimal income, or if you are forced to do a number of things in order to get social support, you don't live a life of freedom and liberty, at least not the kind of life which in a justified system you could, you could lead. So uh, I think the stark opposition between the party of liberty and the party of equality is a mistake. It's a conceptual, it's a conceptual mistake. Um, I agree with Chantal that historically there is an antagonism between a party that defines liberty in a certain way. But should we hand over the term liberty to that interpretation? And then there is um, the party of equality, which is not, I think, interested in equality as an absolute value. It's interested in a society, a society in which there are no forms of domination, such that some 
rule over others with uh, privileges, with um, um, uh, asymmetries or using a social asymmetries that cannot be that cannot be justified. So I think if we consider what justice demands in a system of a justified scheme of social and political institutions, liberty claims, equality claims, different kinds of claims come into the picture and then the alternative interpretations of what liberty means for one party or the other, and usually it's not just two parties, uh, there are various interpretations um, around, so the antagonism is more pluralistic than just two. So that's what needs to be on the table. My argument is that uh, to, to, f to judge, to adjudicate between these different interpretations of liberty, equality, solidarity, sufficiency, um, well-being, and so on, a structure of justification needs to be in place that blocks out the privileges that in many societies as we know them, from the start, predetermine what the result of a justificatory scheme is. So that's the argument. The argument about justice is to improve the justificatory standing of those who are being put into an interpretive category uh, that is defined by discursive hegemony in a neoliberal or whatever other system. So, um, so that's why I think justice has to be the mediating, the vermittelnde Begriff. Uh, well, I think there is a very important misunderstanding uh, because I've never said that there was a stark opposition between liberty and equality. No, and I don't believe that at all in a liberal democracy. Uh, the, 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 the two values, I mean, I speak of, of uh, uh, um, because th that will be the, the Schmittian position. You know, they are incompatible. There is a contradiction. So you've got to, and you say, well, let's get rid of, of, of liberalism and, uh, and, you know, the, the well, of course, we could we could say that he was not really pers uh, his, his defense of democracy is, is 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 not very convincing either. But I mean, th theoretically, uh, because he was an, an, an authoritarian conservative, there is no doubt about that. But at the level of the argument, um, he, he is saying well, precisely what what many people in 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 the, those movements say, liberal. Uh, that it is an oxymoron. I don't think, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that there is, there has been uh, um, an articulation, uh, and, and this is an articulation we can trace it historically. For instance, uh, C.B. McPherson, uh, a little book on the life and times of liberal democracy, is precisely to show, oh, historically, you know, the, the, the liberalism and the democracy and, 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 and the democratic movement were linked together. So, I, and I, for me, this is really, I, I, I defend <laughs> uh, liberal uh, democracy as, as a regime which is a viable regime. But what I'm saying is that, and, and I spoke, if you remember, of a lexical order. Uh, so it's not a question of, uh, they are always, the, the, those two values can't be perfectly reconciled. You could never have at the same time perfect liberty and perfect equality. So there will always be one, you know, which is the, 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 in, uh, the the first in the lexical order. I, I think, for instance, uh, uh, in the case of an, um, for roles, uh, uh, I, I will say in the lexical order, is liberty is the first uh, values. So he's really a, a liberal democrat. While I will say that for Habermas, uh, is, is the value of democracy, which is the one. So it's, it's a democratic uh, 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 liberal, you see? But, the, the, but they are, there is always some, some one value that, that, that is privilege respect to the other. And the, the, the struggle between left and right is precisely about who, who, which one view is, is, should be the one which is the, the determinant. But of course, obviously, a, a, a left that will not respect liberal values, I mean, this is not the kind of left that I would like at all. Uh, and on the other side, it's true that uh, the, a party of the right that does not also accept some form of equality that, that does not exist. So it, it is something which is, uh, no, no, I'm not certainly not saying that it, it there is a stark uh, opposition. But uh, uh, another thing with respect to your structure of justification, uh, what I will say is that, yes, of course, we need, and that's precisely the, 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 the way for, for a, a position to become hegemonic. And here, of course, I want to insist that it's hegemonic in a Gramscian sense, no? It's not in the sense of uh, traditional, uh, uh, well, or, or, or either. 
way of understanding the hegemony as, as something which is, you know, some oppression is winning over. You know, for, for Gramsci, the uh, hegemony is always linked with to, with uh, uh, intellectual and moral reform. So it's it's a construction of of a view of the world. So I think that, for instance, the left should be able, and and that of course is linked to structure of justification. But those structure of justification are never neutral. That that's probably where we've got a disagreement, uh, because it's always the result of an hegemony. It's always an hegemony construction. But of course, the, 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 at, at a certain moment, what Gramsci called the common sense is that for people, this is a, there is a structure of justification which is the one which is accepted, you know, which is the one hegemonic. But uh, uh, it, it doesn't. It always exit the possibility of you know another structure of justification, and that of course is our mood point. Yes. <laughs> we'll respond to that. Yeah, Are thanks. you a democratic liberal or a liberal democrat? I don't know. I'm a. Uh, I don't, well, I would have to think through what place liberty, equality, democracy have um, in a society. Once we thought about this society as one, who, who the basic structure of which would. Um, um, would have structures of justification in place that would not reproduce the dominant power structures that traditionally have uh, determined what justification means here. You see, um, I take democracy to be a practice of justice such that, um, uh, and if critical theory means anything, it means uh, to uh, materialize the principle of critique in social and political structures. Um, so uh, a uh, notion of democratic justice is a notion where stru a, a basic structure of justification is in place such that the justificatory power of persons and groups within that structure isn't radically unequal from the start. Um, and that's my, uh, that's my theory, how in the end certain liberty claims like being free to drive as fast as you like, and others being unfree in order because they can't pass the street. Uh, how you would adjudicate between, between these claims, I cannot foresee. And with Chantal, I don't see the point of foreseeing a perfect reconciliation of all the as evaluative aspects of social, of social life. But I do have an idea. Um, uh, and a theory of justice about the forms and structures in which these things would have to be sorted out democratically in a structure of justification. Just one, one remark, because Chantal identified what she called the mood point between us. Um, is there a point of disagreement uh, here about the principle of justification, which says that no one should be subjected to a normative order of norms, rules, and institutions which cannot be justified to a person as free and equal uh, in a structure of justification. Whether that is uh, a neutral principle um, in the sense of a principle with a, a higher order uh, moral normativity. Um, and, um, and I think it is. Uh, I think it is a principle uh, of justice, of discursive justice, um, which um, plays a role in distinguishing an emancipatory claim and an emancipatory movement, which uses that principle to fight privileges and social asymmetries against others who try to use that principle to reproduce a privilege and an asymmetry. That distinction is important for a critical theorist, and I'd like to hold on to it. So before we move on and, and talk about some of the specific suggestions you made and also um, talk about the movements uh, that were discussed here, um, I don't want to bypass one question I think that would at least have to be touched on here for a moment, and that is uh, to what extent we can hope to attain uh, a just form of democracy without and not just asking about principles of redistribution but also asking questions about production and that would be the C word, I guess, um, capitalism. To what extent uh, would both of you or each of you 
um, be willing to say, if we want to seriously discuss these questions, we also have to talk about capitalism and how feasible it is and how compatible it is with a just democracy. Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, no, I agree absolutely that the question of capitalism is 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 is, is central, um, and and I do uh, uh, believe that uh, uh, capitalism uh, undermines democracy, and 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 that um, it is we need to be aware of that. The question is that um, once you say that. Um, or are we going to go uh, all, all, all on? With, uh, for instance, the, 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 I, I just can't stand the, the, the kind of uh, uh, revolutionary rhetoric of people like Zizek or Badiou who, who are saying uh, totally well, end of capitalism. But, but what does that mean in concrete, you know? Uh, 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 I, I, I think that first there are many different forms of, 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 of capitalism and some are better than others. Definitively, I think, for instance, neoliberalism is, is, is much worse than uh, social democracy, which was also some form of, of capitalism. So uh, ideally, I, 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 I think that um, in, in, in the process of, of, of fighting against inequalities, and we, are, we hope to, to, to move towards a society in which, uh, 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 I would say, capitalism might not, it, it depends, you know, is, is that market society capitalism? It is it's so complicated, you know, to term, the very term capitalism. I'm, I'm reluctant to use the term capitalism because it is like if there was this entity capitalism that we could, so the, they are uh, a form of capitalism, capitalism practice, relation production, and we would like, of course, to go eliminating them, but it's not going to be made in one night, you know, uh, it's going to be, that's what I uh, call the war of position. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's important, for instance, to be to recover so, so some area that uh, liberal, uh, neoliberalism, for instance, has, has been uh, uh, um, taken away. I mean, the, all the process of privatization uh, uh, and, and, and the, the destruction of, of the, the public. I mean, there, there are a lot of struggle that can uh, take place. Struggle which are, uh, I hope, slowly going to move to our society that you know. It, it's certainly not going to be the same kind of uh, society that it, it is today. Uh, may, maybe there will still be a, a, a small uh, uh, area of, of the production that could be called capitalist, and many other areas will not be capitalist. Um, I think that that is something which I, I wouldn't want to, to, to give a very clear an, an answer because we don't know how things could, could evolve. But definitely, I think that it is uh, um, important to uh, think of the way things are produced and the way in which you know certain form of capitalism are def undermining very, very significantly uh, uh, the, the, what we call democracy. I agree with Chantal. Um, if we either think about uh, justice uh, or inclusive democracy, um, we cannot um, uh, avoid speaking about the conditions uh, under which uh, our society uh, produces goods, um, um, regulates this, distributes um, uh, goods also um, on a transnational scale. But if one of the premises of your um, question uh, uh, was that we, in uh, political debate, tend to um, block out the question of capitalism. There is a tendency in me to say yes to some extent, but on the other hand, if you look at it uh, soberly, we talk about the structure of capitalism all the time. We talk about fair wages for those who uh, are on top of the earning pyramid and those at the bottom. Um, we talk about uh, how important it is for states uh, to save uh, the financial sectors uh, from a complete breakdown. Uh, and we have incredible investments made <laughs> in recent years uh, to prevent this. So capitalism today is a heavily state-subsidized form uh, uh, of production. Uh, and and distribution um, and uh, and 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 so on and so on. So we talk about capitalism all the time in all the, most of the political uh, uh, debates. Um, we do. So it's not that this is an issue we shy away from. It's just that um, we uh, often have 
uh, the impression uh, that uh, there are certain forces, certain imperatives we cannot we cannot think in real alternatives uh, uh, about, and so we need to broaden the scope um, of thinking about uh, arranging um, um, markets um, and uh, and constraining um, the disastrous uh, results uh, from um, uh, certain certain forms of allowing new markets to uh, to develop, uh, privatizing. Um, uh, social uh, social services, uh, which sometimes uh, lead to disastrous uh, consequences. So, so it's it's not that we don't talk about it. It's it's our, it's the stuff of everyday of everyday politics. And since we're in the Berlin Stift, and we talk about the disastrous consequences of a non-regulated form of production for uh, the environment uh, for for the last fifty years, that's what we talk about. Well, that's good to hear. Um. <laughs> It is. It is. In the, in the right way, but it's not that we don't talk about it. No, absolutely. Um, I want to come back to, as I said, um, to some of the more specific proposals and uh, questions about the movements that were mentioned. Um, Chantal Mouffe, um, you mentioned a couple of times um, that this is about a, a radical politics. And I think I haven't fully grasped what exactly is radical about it because I think what I got so far was that democratic institutions, representative institutions have to be broadened, they have to be maybe more inclusionary with more uh, channels of empowering people. Um, they have to be reformed though, but I th I'm not sure exactly what I make of the radical aspect of it, if you could clarify well, that. It's very simple, it's, 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 demo, it's what I call radicalization of democracy. You know, so this is what is radical about it. But of course, the problem is that radical is used in so many terms. It's certainly not radical in the in the sense of uh, uh, making a total break. With uh, it's not the revolutionary, you know, form of of, of radicalism. But I think that uh, um, it it is. It seems to me that um, after the collapse of of, of communism. Uh, we because if if you um, think of what you know many of I don't know many uh, people here will even remember that but uh, um, let's say twenty uh, uh, well let's, let's say thirty years ago there was still a, a kind of you know left uh, uh, what we can call the Jacobin left wanted the revolutionary left the, um, the, the, this. Is in a sense almost disappeared. There are still, you know, some people who argue on that run. But it is so. Or I will say to, to think of the struggle against um, our society in terms of the friend and enemy, and that that's the, the kind of Jacobin politics. Well, this, this is something which, uh, fortunately, is is really become completely marginal. But my problem is that uh, the the left or the left have come to terms with the fact of pluralism and with the fact of the importance of, of liberal institution and i think that's a, that's a progress but they've gone too much to the to the extreme because in fact no they have uh, absolutely uh, abandoned the, the idea of a profound transformation of, of uh, uh, power relation. In fact, uh, uh, in, instead of uh, speaking of friend and enemy, no, they see politics in terms of basically a competition um, among elites. So it's a question, there, there is the, the power there uh, in, in, uh, in the, the government. So it's, it's, in, 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 uh, it's a question of alternance, not a question of having an alternative. You know, so, so this, and this is uh, uh, why I think that th this consensus at the center, uh, uh, you know, the third way type of politics is precisely that. We can only know, uh, uh, occupy the differently the p p place of power, but the hegemony is, is not going to be transformed. I mean, we, we've lived that in, in Britain so clearly. After the, 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 the uh, Margaret Thatcher, when uh, Tony Blair uh, came, to, came to power uh, with, with uh, new labor, uh, we were, you know, a bit optimistic, thinking, oh, it's going to really make a, a difference. T Tony Blair completely accepted the terrain which had been created by, by, by Thatcher. Uh, it, in fact, even developed some, some of those uh, uh, p politics of privatization. So it, it, it was really a question of managing a bit more humanely the, 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 the neo neoliberalism. So this is not the kind of left-wing politics, not, not to speak of radical politics. I think that what we are missing today is a real left movement. 
not a left movement of the of the type of the revolution, but a left movement that say there is an alternative to neoliberal order, and this is what I think that the project of a left movement sh should be. Uh, uh, that that's for me it's absolutely important to say there is an alternative, and and if if there'd been such a, 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 a left. In the moment of the crisis in 2008, I think that a very important uh, uh, opportunity was missed because it's the moment when you know the 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 the, the, the all powerful image of of the neoliberal uh, model, the Anglo-American model, showed that you know it was in crisis. But it it was impossible for the left to to take advantage of the situation because they they did not have at all a narrative and in fact in many countries the left and certainly in Britain had contributed to 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 this this crisis, so uh, uh, it, it it's time now uh, uh, and and it's high time I would say for the, the 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 left to abandon this idea that the where they need to be at the center to to develop an, an idea what I call a form of radical. Uh, politics, but a, a radical politics that is not go, is going to be taking place through a profound transformation of power relation, and and uh, this, of course, is is what I call the war of position. You know, so, but it's a radicalization of democracy, it's not a rejection of liberal democratic institution. I'm absolutely convinced that it is possible to have an immanent critique of liberal democracy, because if we take that its principle, our liberty and equality for all, you can't think of more radical principle than that. The the problem with our societies is that they do not put into practice their ideals. So what we need to do is to push them to, to, to put those into practice and not to say that we need to destroy the society, this one in order to build something. That, that if there is a less lesson to be learned from the crisis of, of uh, communism, it's precisely that, you know, that, that, that uh, 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 we can't. Uh, think of al alternative on, on, on that uh, model. But on the other side, we still need to think of the possibility of transforming uh, uh, the, the actual uh, re relation of, of power. And that, of course, is precisely what I'm going to, I'm tra been trying to think with this model of an agonistic democracy. So the, the, the struggle among the, the adversaries is there are different hegemonic projects which are going to enter in confrontation, but within the respect of some, you know, democratic procedure. Right. Well, thank you. And if you don't want to respond to that right away, I would say yes, you may, you may in, a, in a somewhat concise fashion, maybe. I'll try to because um, um, I think we need to to be aware um, that um, when, I, as much as I agree with, with Chantal's um, uh, interpretation um, of the radical protest movements, um, that as, as innovating the and questioning uh, democracy um, uh, to improve uh, its basic structures, um, she also argues for, uh, you know, in good Gramscian fashion, for an alliance of different, uh, of different uh, social uh, protest uh, groups and, um, and and different social claims. But we need we need to be aware that um, this is a difficult thing. Um, and one reason why I'm flirting with the idea of group representation is that the big protest of the young that changes the social system might not be the changes that the big protest movement of the old would prefer. Uh, the big protest movement uh, of the unions might not be exactly what the big protest movements of the migrants uh, are hoping for. And so forming alliance is one thing. Seeing the rifts in an alliance that would bring about a new form of politics is another. And so I think a progressive political system has to be open to the differences um, uh, of uh, radical claims and give them a forum um, where um, where there's less, well, there's always a certain pressure to form an alliance, but then there's also a certain Darwinism uh, about, uh, about such uh, processes and there's also an injustice implied in the justice movement that becomes or creates the dominant voice. Thank you very much. Um, I think now we'll have a chance to uh, have a couple of questions from the audience and um, our discussants will respond to 
whatever they find most interesting. Um, please. Is it working? Yeah. Um, I would like to come back to Chantal Mouffe, uh, Mouffe's assessment of the new social movements, or maybe social uprises, um, we'd rather say. And um, the question of, um, I mean, or my question would be, what what is the, um, the context or the conditions that are needed for that um, those uprises become what you might call um, like inter interventionist movements who engage into the he hegemonic um, struggle. Is, it, um, is that something um, you can define or is it like um, uh, happen chance? Is it by accident? Is it um, something that is radical contingent? Maybe we'll uh, just have a couple of questions if there are any more questions. Now is the chance. Um, just one more question, and um, um, to to Shandamuf as well, um, because I was wondering the, the radicalization. You, you kind of said I I wondered if it's not in the institutions we have right now that um, you kind of always have to go for um, for the middle. If the, the parties have to go kind of into the middle f and to the other side to, in order to get votes, so in order to um, Proceed kind of the other side because you know the, the their own side kind of already will vote for them, so they kind of have to persuade kind of the the, the swing voters. So if if this um, this problem to kind of get the swing voters, if that kind of is um, uh, causes that that the blur between um, left and right and this kind of um, yeah, would go against the radicalization of democracy, and if we, if that, and, and then means that we kind of need new institutions. Maybe what forced, um, um, kind of introduce or claim, um, ask for for this veto for the worst off. We kind of need this kind of institutions in order to get the radicalization back into democracy. Um, if we need different institutions in order to to get this radicalization, we'll take one more question, maybe I think over there. Arn Polman is my name. Um, I wonder why you agreed on so many things, uh, since uh, my impression was that your two models of uh, democracy are very different from each other. Chantal Mouffe, you more have an antagonistic model of democracy, whereas Rainer Forst somehow has a consensus model of democracy. Two very different things, but let me put you or press you to the same question. What do you both think of the majority rule? That's all. I think that's a great final question, if there's no one else. Um, Please. Oh, oh, maybe one more? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like uh, you both uh, to a little bit concretize uh, what you mean by an agonistic sphere of democracy and uh, a process of, a process of uh, justification on the other hand. So um, it's, it follows up a, a little bit uh, the point uh, Arndt uh, made just a minute ago. So um, I think there's maybe a little less agreement on those two concepts than uh, we've been hearing before. Thank you. Whoever wants to go first. Uh, yes, well, I, th I think that the disagreement between us is are mainly philosophical and theoretical, but um, that uh, when it comes to concrete politics, we, 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 we will probably defend the same proposal. I always have, have had this uh, type of relation with Habermas. You know, I've always criticized uh, Habermas theory because, but in fact, when Habermas makes 
proposal, as a citizen, I usually agree with what is, is uh, and uh, so um, I, I think that sometimes, of course, it doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that I don't think that you know a theoretical issue don't have any consequences uh, because obviously if if for instance you uh, uh, have in mind that the, the importance of an agonistic confrontation uh, you are going to uh, uh, develop or uh, institutions which are different from the one that the uh, people who want a deliberative democracy uh, advocate so they are differences but on the short term let's say when when you are uh, confronted with uh, uh, um, measure of neoliberals, we, we, we will react in the same way. But, but when we imagine the, the kind of institution that really will be important in order to develop democracy, then probably yes, we will uh, have different proposals. But so there, there is a, a, a whole area in which on concrete proposal at a certain moment we, 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 we do agree. But the difference are, are basically a more uh, uh, philosophical and on, I would say that ont ontological really. Um, so the, 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 let me see what I can, um, well, yes, yeah, so in fact, that here I could say already that, yes, it does need a d different kind of institution. Um, from here, no? Um, so, uh, well, an agonistic democracy, of course, will first need to have a clear distinction between, you know, a, a left and a right. For me, that is something which is absolutely central. Uh, um, and to, uh, uh, it means that to have, for instance, a left that is proposing something which is different from uh, the proposal of of the of, of the of the, the center right. You know, I remember uh, I've often uh, uh, um, joked with my uh, student, um, saying, "Well, basically, and that could be said in many different countries. You know, well, what the difference between uh, the center right, center left uh, is basically different between Coca Cola and Pepsi Cola." So uh, it is no surprise that uh, uh, citizens are not motivated to go and vote, you know, because they don't think that is going to make any difference. And, uh, and by the way, this is how I, and, and I explain the development of right-wing populist movement, because right-wing populist movement, they, they, they uh, interpolate the people in a different way and say there is an alternative. We are going to give you the, po the power to decide, you see? So or, uh, uh, so the consequence of this concession of the center is either depoliticization, uh, abstention, or move towards uh, 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 those parties, pop populists of the, of the right, which develop uh, the, this, uh, 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 pretend that there is an alternative. What is the condition uh, the, um, for those uprising to engage in hegemonic struggle? Well, I can, I'm going to give you an example of something which is going into that direction, and I think it's the case of Greece. The case of Greece is extremely interesting, and, and it just showed that in a, it's a good example I mean, uh, uh, of, of my thesis. Because in Greece, you, oh, uh, it, it began in Syntagma Square by you know, the, the, um, in the, the local indignant, the Anganers um, and uh, But very quickly, of course, the situation in, in Greece uh, ex explained in part that, the, the, the movement became much more uh, uh, mo mo popular mo mobilization. You know, there was not only, and in fact, th those uh, um, indignants, some of have now joined the, the big movement or they've, they've got disappeared. And they've been, in fact, the, the, mom the moment uh, uh, is very interesting in Greece because there is a political leadership in Greece to, 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 to this mass mobilization. It's the party of Syriza, uh, uh, which is, uh, um, in fact, it, it's, a, it's a party which is really not one single party, it's, it's an union of different parties. But there is a leadership, Alexis Tsipras is giving a leadership. So you, you found the way in which those different uh, movements could find some form of political uh, uh, um, de determ vo vocabulary, a political organization. And I think it's a movement which definitively is 
fighting, you know, through democratic procedure. In fact, they almost came to power uh, last time, and it will not be surprising given the situation in Greece and the fact that no, they even close the, the, the public television and radio. It's, it's absolutely incredible, you know, in the demo in democratic society. So I think that uh, Syriza is not at all impossible that they will come to power uh, in, in the next election. So th this is a way in which, and, and Syriza is definitely uh, wanting to transform profoundly uh, 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 Greece. It's, it's an hegemonic project. It's a project to come to power in order to really transform uh, the Greece. Situation in, in, in uh, uh, Spain is very different. Uh, because in, in situation in Spain, well, also in a sense, the movement has not been, you know, there were the indignados and then there was a the much wider popular movement when the Partido Popular came to power because they implemented, you know, incredible austerity strategy, uh, uh, policy. So the, the different, more groups uh, um, participated into it, uh, the, the, the uh, protest, it became some kind of popular mobilization. But there, there was not a Izquierda Unida, which is the party on the left of the of the Socialist Party, who could have provided. Well, they they they, they don't have a leader. They are fighting. So they, there is the, the the situation there is not so uh, promising in in in, in political terms. So there is a, an element of contingency, definitely. What I think what we we can see is the importance is that those movements, you know, are articulated with the struggle of the trade union, for instance, both in Greece and in Spain, the trade union are very you know, important in, in mobilization with parties and the, the necessity of some kind of leader who is going to orientate uh, this movement, give them a, a, a direction. But of course, you never know so, uh, if those conditions are going to be fulfilled, you see. But just the last thing, uh, uh, and, and that uh, um, linked to something that Rainer said before, of course, is, is uh, uh, I'm absolutely aware of the fact that the, the, the demands of the young can be very different from the demand. And, and this is precisely, for instance, the, the one of the reasons why I've criticized the slogan of the we are the 99% of, of Occupy because I mean this is completely unrealistic uh, and they seem to g take it for granted that they are, uh, there is already a, a, a comment, no, they, the, this, need, this need to be constructed you know, th this is something, and, and that, in fact, by the way, we don't speak of alliance. In a German socialist strategy, we speak of the need to articulate a chain of equivalence between the movement. Chain of equivalence precisely uh, uh, is taking account of the fact that those movements, as they are expressed, they, 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 they are, they conflict, for instance, in many cases, the demand of the women are in, in contradiction with the demand of the trade unions, and um, so it, the, the work of, of political organization is precisely to, uh, construct a common political subject, all of those, th those differences. And of course, this is something which is not easy, but I think that's the only way in which one can really uh, create a, a, an, an important popular mobilization that is go really going to have impact and change uh, the, 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 the situation and, and radicalize a democratic institution. All right, thank you. Heiner, you have the final word. Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Arndt. Your, your question gives me a chance to say a word about how I see things um, between antagonism uh, or agonism and, and consensus theories. First, I'm not a consensus theorist. I, I don't think that truth about normative statements is to be found by consensus. Uh, I think um, the, there, are, there are justifiable claims and not justifiable claims. Uh, and by the structure of the claim being reciprocally rejectable or non-rejectable, an equality claim, a material equality claim about same-sex marriage is not rejectable with the quality of with arguments of the quality about God's will or the tradition of an institution. So that's where I look where I locate my normative investment, but it's not in consensus. Um, is uh, Chantal an, an antagonistic theorist? Yes, to some to, to uh, a large extent she is, but she makes a clear case about the democratic constraints of a normative framework of respecting the other as an opponent uh, of the rules of the game. And the normative investment in these rules is something about what I would call democratic justice. So part of what justice is about is to think about the labels we use to describe ourselves and others, and one might find surprising things. I do, however, hold on to one thing 
um, um, where we might uh, differ. I do believe that the principle that persons as free and equal persons should not be subjected to norms and institutions that cannot be properly, properly justified to them as free and equal. I do believe that the right to justification inherent in that principle is, is a moral, moral right not deniable with good reasons. So there's a normative investment which a Kantian like me would have to make. Okay. Um, damit sind wir am Ende. Damit sind wir am Ende angekommen. Ich darf Sie aber alle noch ähm, einladen, einfach ein Stockwerk nach unten zu gehen. Da unten gibt es Musik, Getränke und hoffentlich sehr viele gute Unterhaltungen. Und darüber hinaus auch dann äh, morgen Vormittag noch ein, eine weitere Elefantenrunde, wie es heute verkündet wurde, wenn ich es richtig verstanden habe, äh, zu der Sie natürlich auch alle kommen sollten. Ich bedanke mich nochmal, im Deutschen Theater ist es. Ich bedanke mich nochmal sehr herzlich äh, bei unseren Diskutanten und Diskutantinnen Chantal Muff und Rainer Voss und wünsche Ihnen noch einen wunderbaren Abend.